Hi. <laughs> All right. So welcome. It is Saturday. It is 12 noon. It's actually 12.01 now. And we are going to get started. Whoever is here, if you're seeing this live, welcome. I'm so excited that you are here. If you catch this on the replay or... If you catch this on the replay or you see this in the workshop uh, notes down below, that little bubble that you can go ahead and look at, it's a highlight on the top of my Instagram. Go ahead and watch, feel free. If you want to, you can tag yourself or you can tag a friend who might benefit from this. Whatever works best for you. So I'm gonna try to start doing this each Saturday, so I'm really excited. If you are here, that's wonderful. Again, if you're just coming in, just welcome. Welcome to the Instagram live feed on my channel. And again, I'm going to save this to the workshop bubble on the top of my Instagram when this is all done. So we're gonna go for probably about 30 minutes. I'm gonna watch the timer. Hi, is that Christopher? Hi, Christopher. <laughs> um, we're gonna go for about 30 minutes. So I'm gonna be kind of looking at the clock to make sure we stay on time because I really appreciate you being here today. And if there's any questions, definitely put them down below. I can still see some of the Instagram and kind of like, uh, like chat space. So I'll try to answer any questions towards the end. But today we're gonna talk about destructive criticism. So I might give another minute to see if anyone else pops on. But again, if you're watching the replay, if you're watching live, thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited. So I am Sasha. I am a holistic mindset coach. And today, again, we're going to talk about destructive criticism. So what is destructive criticism? Now, I'm sure if you're a human and you live in the world, you have probably had an experience with destructive criticism at some point in your life. It's basically where someone makes you feel bad about yourself. Uh, and sometimes it's intentional and sometimes it's unintentional. We're gonna discuss that in a moment. But what is it really? Destructive criticism is sort of a natural phenomenon that happens in the brain. We're all sort of wired to be slightly negative, and that's not a bad thing. That is actually sort of our caveman, cavewoman days where it actually kept us safe from things like tigers or lions or, you know, a bear around the corner. It actually made us sort of take into that, you know, taken that information, taken our extra sensory information. And if it was something that our brains naturally didn't like, we would kind of, you know, pull that into a section of our brain and think, okay, how can I think critically on this? How can I be preemptive and make sure that I stay alive? Unfortunately, now it's a survival mechanism that we don't really use. In our modern world, we don't really need this. And so it goes sort of unchecked. And what happens is that negativity kind of starts to grow. Um, because we don't use it anymore, it basically gets channeled or funneled into a different direction. And that becomes basically the criticism that people have towards themselves or towards the world. Now, why do people do this? Realistically, here's the big secret. Critical people are most critical on themselves. They reserve the most criticism for themselves. But unfortunately, instead of actually acting on that and thinking, okay, well, I'm really critical or I'm self-critical about this thing that I don't necessarily like within myself, instead of trying to find a technique to work within themselves, it gets projected outward. Hi, is that Thrift E in Seattle? Welcome, I'm, I'm just north of Seattle. So if you're just joining us, thank you so much. So what we're talking about is why people do the critical self uh, talk and also how it becomes destructive criticism. So what happens, the big secret is people who are self-critical and basically it doesn't, it doesn't get funneled just towards themselves. They start to project it out and that projection out is really anyone within a vicinity, within a day, within a moment that they would actually go ahead and, and uh, encounter. So you know, those critical people really, the second secret is they often don't like something about themselves. And because they don't like something about themselves, they actually feel inferior. They feel like they're at a deficit. And so in order to feel better, instead of, you know, changing that behavior, changing that self-critical thought or that characteristics that they're not happy about with themselves, they project that out. And so you're actually feeling the projection of what they feel about themselves. Now, this is kind of a good thing and a bad thing. You can go kind of two ways. There are two kind of buckets that people mostly fall into. The first bucket is where people genuinely think, hey, what I have to say is really valid and you need to hear it. But, you know, an example would be, you should never wear that color of makeup or, you know, your hair should really, you know, you should do this about your hair or you should never wear an A-line dress. That just doesn't make sense for your body shape. They think in their mind, their perception is you're going to say, wow, that's amazing. I had no idea. Thanks for telling me. <laughs> I'm going to totally never do that again. And so they think that they're valid. They think that they're right. And they think that they're really genuinely trying to help. 
That's sort of bucket one. The other bucket are the people who really are trying to elevate themselves by putting you down, by saying something really destructively critical so that they feel better. Imagine yourself on a teeter-totter. The people who are doing destructive criticism in the second bucket genuinely think, you're higher than me on this teeter-totter. I need to say something to bring you down by default, evening, you know, not evening us out, but by default, me elevating myself. Now this destructive criticism is again the two major secrets where people are you know super self-critical about themselves they really don't like something about themselves so they feel the need to put you down in order to feel better about themselves. Now here is how you actually deal with those critical people. There's first and foremost you're responsible for your reaction. Okay, so no matter what, you are responsible for your reaction. You're not responsible for what they say to you. You're not responsible for the words that they, you know, the word choice that they use, but you are responsible for how you react to those particular comments. Now, the best thing you can do is to create, basically, if you imagine words, we can't see the words moving around, right? But they're an energy form. They're, you know, so you can hear sound waves, right? You know, but they're an energy form those sound waves are coming into your ear and you're hearing them. If you visualize a stop sign, you can just basically kind of mentally block the, the energy coming into basically in, into you, into uh, what you would consider you know, that part of you that you would be offended by those comments. Put up a stop sign. You don't need to have that come into you. Now that's the visual representation. Your brain will play with that and your brain will genuinely be like, oh, okay, these inf this information is not coming in. I'm not accepting it. I'm stopping it. Those people have those comments, that's fine. That's a visual representation. That's the first step of doing it. The next step is without sarcasm, without bitterness, say, thanks, but I don't agree. Now the biggest thing in bucket one, the people who genuinely think they're trying to be, you know, helpful, maybe you don't know that that, that outfit doesn't look good on you. Maybe you don't know that that behavior is something I hate. Now those particular people in bucket one who really think they're trying to be helpful, if you just say simply, you know what, thanks, but I don't agree, they're gonna be like, oh, okay. And most of those people will kind of back off. They may realize that their destructive criticism is not being helpful. It might actually open up a dialogue where you can have a better communication with that individual. But the biggest thing, you don't have to agree with them. If they're saying something mean to you, if they're saying something destructive and hurtful, you don't have to agree. You can put that visual stop sign up, all right? You don't have to use your actual hand, but you can have sort of a metaphorical visual in your mind of a stop sign. Someone's saying words to me, my stop sign comes up, it's not coming in, it's not reaching me, okay? And then you can say, if you're if you're feeling confident enough, perhaps if this is a coworker, you may wanna kinda of work up to it, or you can just say, you know, casually as you walk by, thanks, but I don't agree. And that will stop a lot of the behavior that happens with bucket A. Bucket B is just a little bit different. Bucket B, those individuals who really feel that they are better than you in some capacity, that second bucket, you're gonna do a little bit different of a scenario. So in this scenario, I wanna just make this clear. You're responsible for your behavior, you're responsible for your tone. So really, with all genuine feeling, try not to have any sarcasm or bitterness because we don't want the situation to escalate, we don't wanna cause a fight, we just want them to realize that it's not, you know, their destructive criticism is not helpful and it's not being received, we would like it to stop. So what you can do is you can say, now, depending upon your personality, you can either look them in the eye and say, you know what? This obviously isn't about me and pause and just wait because the person in bucket B a couple things can happen when people are actually seen you use eye contact and you're talking directly to them realistically all of a sudden the barriers start to fall down because they see they see you looking at them they feel seen and heard and I have seen experiences in the past working with people where all of a sudden a friendship kind of blossoms and you may think no this is never going to happen that's totally impossible but realistically the person who's doing the destructive behavior the person who is being destructively critical because they actually have a deep-seated feeling of being either inferior you know being seen all of a sudden makes what they're saying more um, 
uh, it, it kind of amplifies it, but it amplifies it and projects it back at them. So again, all you have to say is, this is obviously not about me. And it tells the person, oh, it's not about, yeah, actually it's, it is totally me. I'm having a terrible day or, you know, all this stuff kind of happened to me and now, you know, just ignore me. I'm just, you know, sorry. And they'll kind of back off. But you can actually start a dialogue that's really wonderful and, and could be very cathartic, especially if it's something that they are continuously doing. Uh, all of a sudden they feel seen, they feel heard, and that might really help them. The second thing is you can just stare. If you're not uh, confident enough to kind of say the words or you're kind of getting agitated, you can feel like, you know, what they're saying is starting to kind of get in and you're kind of feeling like your blood's kind of boiling, you're starting to get angry, or you're starting to feel really offended. Just stare at them. Most people, <laughs> especially people who are very self-critical, again, they have that wall. Now, if the wall's not coming down and they're just saying something really mean, staring at them silently, it puts it back on them. Again, because this has nothing to do with you. It could be anyone they're saying something mean to. They might, you might just be the 19th person, person they've said something mean to, and you're the only one that's actually kind of, you know, putting it back in their face. You don't have to do it in a mean way. Again, you're responsible for your own behavior. Take out any bitterness, take out any, you know, kind of anger, and just look at them. You can also say, oh, can you repeat that? Maybe a little slower this time? I didn't quite hear you. Because what happens is it takes what they're projecting, what they don't like within themselves. It takes that, they're projecting it out on you, it puts it back on them. And then they're forced to think about what they're saying. They're forced to actually now analyze, oh, my behavior isn't necessarily, it's not being appreciated, uh, it's, you know, it's coming back to me. And, oh, this really has nothing to do with the person that I'm talking about. Now, the second person, you know, the, this bucket B, the, the person who is self-critical, the one who kind of says, oh, I'm sorry, I'm back off. It's, I'm just having a terrible day. They'll usually walk away, maybe have a dialogue. The second person, you may not have a dialogue. It may not really kind of resolve it for them. It may not be something that they're really able to deal with at this time. But realistically, they're not going to harass you anymore. They're not going to do destructive criticism to you anymore because you just put it back on their own lap. And they don't want to be confronted with the stuff, their own ish that they don't want to deal with. So again, the other thing you can do, and I'm just looking at my notes here, um, and this is a good one for family members. If you're dealing with a really destructively critical family member, and this is sort of the, I, I work with a mother-daughter relationship and building really good tight bonds with a mother-daughter bond. And so in the mother-daughter relationship, oftentimes there is uh, some critical uh, critiquing that comes from the mom. And so in, with usually the best intent and you know with love in mind, but the mom may be very critical about something that either the daughter is doing or something they think that they should be doing or just a behavior or a uh, physical attribute that they um, that they want to improve and they don't really know how to get it to improve and so they become more critical and then that criticism becomes more and more destructive. Oftentimes in the mother-daughter dynamic, the female, the daughter who is receiving the information, even if it's the most loving, you know, you sit down, you hold a hand, you have like a cup of tea, sometimes it's just not received well. And so it becomes more and more destructive because the daughter will think oftentimes, you know, mom really doesn't like me or she hates me or, you know, that internal chatter starts to go on in the daughter's mind. So in the mother-daughter relationship, or if you have a mother, let's say you're older and you have a mother who is doing this, um, you can always do this particular thing. And this works really, really well, especially with a loved one. It can work well with a spouse. It can work well with um, uh, older parents, things like that. You say to them, do you want me to feel bad? And kind of inquire. This is an inquiring comment. This isn't, do you want me to feel bad? This is a, oh, you've said this or I've heard you say this now multiple times, <clears throat> do you want me to feel bad? And oftentimes our loved ones who can be very critical of us, especially if they think they, you know, they have the love at heart, but they want us to be doing something. When they look at you and they say, no, I don't want you to feel bad. I just really need you to brush your hair every day, right? <laughs> or I really need you to do fill in blank. The reason why that person is doing that is because they might want to just teach you something and they don't know how to go, go about doing it or they might really think, 
you know, gosh, I had this terrible experience and now I'm trying to prevent you from having the same kind of experience or a similar experience. So I'm trying to educate you and give you my wisdom. And it's just not being received. It's being received as this destructive criticism, especially if it's repeated more than one time. And so what you can do again is just look at them in the eye and say, you know, honey or mom or, you know, whatever pet name you might have for someone. Or if this is like a, uh, a cousin or a sibling, just say, hey, do you want me to feel bad? The inquiry opens up a dialogue and it opens up a dialogue that most family members or loved ones or even best friends are not going to say, yeah, yeah, I really want you to feel like crap today. Yeah. You know, they're, <laughs> that's not usually what they're going for. In, in situations like that, mostly what they're going to say is, no, of course not. Of course I don't want you to feel bad. And then you can say, well, why do you keep saying the same thing to me? You know, where, where is this going? And then it can open up that dialogue of the individual kind of explaining their perspective because everyone has their own perspective. And again, most of the destructive criticism is, you know, bucket A. People think that they're trying to be helpful. They think their information is accurate and fact. And so they're just trying to give you this wisdom and they don't understand why you're not receiving it. So if you can turn it back on them, then you can say, okay, well, you know, this information is really hurtful to me. This information is not helpful <laughs> and I don't appreciate it. And that way you can kind of end it or you can at least have that dialogue where, you know, you can understand the other person's perspective and they can understand yours. Now, the next thing I like to do is this is, this so far this has all been, hi again, <laughs> so far this has all been about other people talking to you. But I want to highlight something. How can you prevent yourself from doing this to others as well? Because what can happen is we think, oh gosh, you know, I'm being super awesome and I've got all this insight. Hi there. Um, I've got all this insight to give, but you know, gosh, I, you know, I would never say something like that to anyone else. Realistically, you need to do two things. First of all, if you are going to give feedback, thank you. Oh my gosh. Thank you for the hearts, you guys. And remember, if you think anyone would benefit from this, you can tag them in it and it will go into the workshop bubble on top of the Instagram feed. So you can still watch it later. Okay. So how can you avoid doing this yourself to other people? The biggest thing is ask a question. If you are going to say something to someone else, you want to ask, is this a fact or is this an opinion? So the difference would be a fact would be water is wet. That's a fact. You know, we don't need to get into the metaphysics of it, but in general, water is wet. That is something we see as a fact, you know? You know, you have hair or you don't have hair. That might be a fact, right? Uh, the sky is blue today. That could be a fact, depending upon where you live, right? Or what time of day it is. But you want to ask yourself, is this a fact? You know, the sun is bright. Is this a fact? If it's not a fact, then it's an opinion. You know, your hair is too frizzy. That's just an opinion. Even if you think, well, but their hair is frizzy. That's a fact. No. Their hair is what you perceive as frizzy. They might perceive as, you know, curly. They might perceive as, you know, I just blow dried it and it's just sort of, you know, it's doing its natural thing. It's not frizzy. It's just natural today. But you saying, but it's a fact. No, it's just your opinion. So to make sure that you're not doing destructive criticism, criticism on others, you want to ask yourself, is this an actual fact? right? Like I have paper in my hand. Do I? Do, yeah, that's a fact. Okay. Right. Or, you know, I don't like A-line dresses on you. <laughs> that's just an opinion. Now, if you really genuinely think I really need to tell this information to this person because they obviously are not, you know, maybe I feel like they must not have a mirror at home. They, you know, something's happening. They're just totally clueless on this situation. Then you're going to pose a question. Okay. And the question is, is it okay for me to give you some advice or is it okay for me to tell you my opinion? Now, if someone is actually asking you, let's say they're in front of a mirror and they say the proverbial, you know, does this make me look fat or does this make me look weird? They're not really asking you a question. They're looking for feedback that's positive. 
so they can feel good about themselves. They're in that moment where they can either go down, you know, again, when we go back to why do people do destructive criticism, it's because they have an inherent feeling of feeling lesser or they have an inherent feeling of being self-critical. There's something about themselves they don't like. So you have this wonderful moment of helping reassure someone. If someone says, you know, hey, does this make me look bad? You can say, you know, yeah, you look terrible in that. But that's only going to feed that insecurity. If you say, well, do you want my actual opinion? And then pause. And then the person can say, oh, no, because I actually like this outfit. So no, <laughs> no, I'm good. I'm just like, should I buy it or should I wear it? Or, you know, is it good for the particular day that we're going on? Or, you know, should I get this? You know, maybe they just want some reassurance. Hey, that color does look good on you. I feel like maybe we should look for it in a different, uh, in a different outfit or a different, you know, pattern or something like that. But ask them, because most of the time people have an inherent feeling of that, you know, that value, that self-worth isn't coming out. And so a lot of times when people will say something like in front of a mirror or if they're like, should I shop this or whatnot, it's because they already feel insecure about it. So you just saying something that comes out as destructive criticism is just feeding that, you know, that feeling of not feeling worthy, that not feeling enough, not feeling valuable, and that insecurity, which will then get projected out to others. So you have a wonderful opportunity in that moment. Again, just say, do you want my opinion? Or would you like to hear what I have to say about this? Now, if they're not asking you an actual question and it's just random, you know, you show up at school, you show up at work, you show up at a family function, you know, your kid walks through, you know, the hallway into the kitchen and you're like, wow, um, no, no, turn around, go back and change. Or, you know, hey, I really cannot stand, you know, have you washed your hair like recently or like ever? You know, have you brushed your hair in like a month? These are all really destructively critical things because it makes a person feel bad. It puts them on sort of the defensive. Instead, what you can say is, you know, hi, how's it going? Or, oh, how are you? Great. Um, did you know that I bought more of this? You know, maybe we should do some laundry together. <laughs> or, hey, you know, have you had a chance to take a shower recently and check out the new shampoo? I used it, it's great, right? These are all kind of workarounds where you can kind of tell someone gently, I need you to do something. Now, again, if they are feeling really critical or they're feeling really defensive, those walls might go up and they may not be able to receive the information that you're saying to them, even if it's coming from the heart. So make sure that you're doing this in a time and a space that they are most receptive. If it's a loved one, realistically, kind of like end of the day calm time is better than before any kind of scheduled rushing out the door time. If it's someone where you're in a work environment or someone where you are um, you know, in a school or an education environment and you're just kind of in these close proximity tight areas and you just really are like, okay, I just can't deal with this person anymore. They're always saying ne negative critical things. I would highly recommend, first of all, think about your mindset. If you have empathy for this individual, if you think, you know, again, back to bucket A and bucket B. Is this person trying to bestow wisdom that they think is genuinely going to help me? Okay, well, maybe, you know, I'll listen to what they have to say, even though I can always say, thank you, but I don't agree. <laughs> and then just walk away. The other person, bucket B, think, does this person really have a hard time with something right now? Like, are they projecting out an inner anger you know, maybe they just need a sounding board. Maybe they just need someone to hear them. And in those circumstances, you can say, hey, this is obviously not about me. Give them my contact and just wait. Because some people will again say, hey, you're right. Ugh, I'm just having a terrible day. I just, you know, I need to vent or I'm just, I'm sorry. What I said was totally offline. Other people who are just very critical and not ready to deal with their own internal ish will just walk away. They'll be kind of like, oh, you're putting this right back in my lap and you caught me, this has nothing to do with you. All right, I'm obviously not gonna say mean things to you anymore because you totally called me on my shit, so, <laughs> sorry. But anyways, so again, we're just gonna recap. Why do people do it? The secret is they really don't like something about themselves and they're not ready or they're not aware of that particular thing, maybe they are. And so they really just need to kind of work that out. But if you say, again, hey, thank you, 
but I don't agree. Or this is clearly not about me. Then it can help diffuse that a ton. And then have a little empathy. Think, again, what they're saying to me has nothing to do with me. It really doesn't because it's true. It has nothing to do with you. Destructive criticism has nothing to do with you. It's always what is happening in the individual internally, okay, with their own emotions. Now, if you are doing the destructive paper, destructive behavior yourself, if you're being, you're doing destructive criticism to someone else, you have to think, ask yourself this question. Is this a fact or is this an opinion? And if it's an opinion, keep it to yourself. Keep it to yourself because the other person really doesn't need to necessarily hear it. Now, if you really think, but they do, they so do, they need to hear this, I need to give them this information, then what you can do is go back and literally say, hey, you know, I have an opinion about this, can I share it with you? And then just wait. If they say, oh, sure, you know, say, okay, I'm gonna try to do this as delicately as I can. I really feel like this and this and this. If they say no, that's it. You know, you do not need to share your opinion with someone. You can journal it. You can write it down. You can, you know, go over it in your head and think, why do I have this opinion about this other person? But really, you don't need to do it. So if they say no after you ask, then let it go. All right. So we are going to go to questions. If you have any questions, and I also have some journal questions for you to work with. If you'd like, we can do them here uh, live, or you can go ahead. I'm going to post a square on Instagram, so they'll be also be posted if you want more time to think about it. Um, but if you have any questions, let's see. Go ahead. I'm going to try to scroll here. Let's see. I see lots of waves. Thank you. Question. Let's see. Um, yes. Oh, let's see if I can go back. Is Christopher, yes, your question, does age play a part? Absolutely. So the way you would talk to someone who is five years old is obviously very different than you know the way you would talk to someone who's you know in their 40s or their 50s or their 80s. So um, for the most part, if someone is doing, so if let's say they're over 20. So over 20 in general, these are adults. These are people who are going to be understanding that um, they're either being self-critical, they've already inherited or developed that self-criticism. And again, people who are really critical of others are most critical on themselves. So remember that, keep the empathy in there. Understand it has nothing to do with you. So if this is an older person, 20 or older, then you're going to do all of these techniques just the way I mentioned. If this person is, let's say, 20 or under, so let's say they're in their teens or their tweens or whatnot, the, basically what you're gonna do, it's very, very similar, but you're gonna come at it at more of sort of an educational standpoint. And you're gonna say, hey, maybe you didn't know, or maybe you weren't aware Right? So let's say they're being really, really critical. They're being really destructive criticism. They're just saying a lot of things that are just mean. Then you can say, hey, you know, at your age, I understand this is hard. Maybe you weren't aware that that behavior is really critical. Is there something that you want to talk about that you are having a hard time with with yourself? And give them time. With kids, especially the younger they are, the easier the language and the sl not the not slower, but the more time you give for them to think about it, the better response you will get. So with teenagers, you know they get things kind of fast, you know, so they're going to be and they might be kind of you know looking in other directions, but for the most part, they're going to be like, oh yeah, and give them time. They may not want to talk about something right then and there. They might need a day or so to actually think about it. So if you ask a teenager or, or anyone, let's say, um, like 12 years old or to the 20 range, and you say, hey, you know, I noticed that you're doing a lot of critical talk to other people. You're saying things that are really destructively critical about others. Would you like to talk about something? You know, is something bothering you? Is there something ab about yourself that you're feeling really frustrated with that you need to help, you need help working out? And then just quiet. You know, you can ask each question slowly or differently or just kind of give a pause in each one, but let them think about it because a lot of times with kids, this is learned behavior, right? They've started to do this. No one's kind of caught it beforehand or maybe if they're really young, you're just catching it. And they need time to think about it. So if they start to say, I don't know, I don't know, which is a classic answer for people who are younger, <laughs> you know, or just like, shut up, whatever, leave me alone. If you're getting any of that resistance, that's okay. You've asked the question. The subconscious mind will mull it over. So give them time. You don't need an answer right then and there, okay? 
So if they come to you a day later or a couple days, you can always say, hey, you know what? I think, you know, I, if you need time to think about this, that's totally fine. I'm always available to talk to you about this because I really want you to feel happy. And I see that when you're saying really critical things about others, you just don't really feel like you have that spark and that happiness. And so I just wanna, you know, kind of put that out there. You know, I'm always available to talk about this. If anything comes up in the next couple of days that you think of, I'm here for you. And then just try to really be cognizant. If they are kind of like, you know, hanging around you or just kind of like hovering, that might mean that they need to talk and they haven't quite, you know, formulated the words yet. Um, and they might be a little bit embarrassed to talk to you about it. So yes, age is huge. Now, if it's younger kids, you know, sort of younger than, than uh, 10 to 12, much, much younger. These are like five, six year olds and they're just starting that critical talk. First of all, monkey see, monkey do. So make sure that you yourself or anyone around them could be school kids, it could be you know their peers, it could be you know a uh, child, uh, anyone who's like caring for them. Make sure that all of those individuals are aware. Okay, we don't do critical, you know, we don't do critical self-talk, so we don't you know berate ourselves openly in front of our kids, right? We don't, uh, you know, sit there and say mean stuff to ourselves, you know, so we have to really check our own, you know, our own sort of destructive demons inside. And also then again, same kind of situation where you're just going to kind of, you know, bring up the questions to the kids. And what I love the most with younger children, younger kids, because they haven't quite formulated that defense mechanism just yet, puppets, dolls, you know, Transformers, G.I. Joes, anything that they love and play with, dinosaurs, hi there, anything that they love and play with, they can project their feelings onto that toy. So you can take a toy, I'm just gonna use, I'm gonna use two pens because I have them in front of me. You can use, you know, that toy and say, you know, um, Barbie here (laughs) has been really saying a lot of things that are kind of mean or really critical of, you know, Skipper over here. And I'm just wondering, you know, does Barbie have something that she feels kind of bad about? You know, does she need to say something to Skipper or does Barbie feel kind of bad about something? You know, what do you think? And those kids, it's magic. They'll project their feelings onto that toy and it gives you insight to what their brain is thinking. So they might actually never say to you, yeah, you know, um, I'm hearing a lot of this kind of negative talk at school where so-and-so tells me that I'm, you know, stupid or fat or I have, you know, ugly shirts or something like that, right? They're not going to come home and say, hey, yeah, so-and-so was being really critical about this to me at school and it made me feel really bad, but their doll, their doll can say, yeah, I have ugly shirts and nobody likes me. <laughs> and then you can say, oh, okay, so this has nothing to do with Skipper. It just has to do with, you know, how Barbie feels about her shirts. Okay, well, let's have a discussion about Barbie's shirts. You know, why does Barbie think her shirts are not cool? You know, was something said about those? And so you can just open up this dialogue. And again, once the dialogue starts flowing, you can just inquire more and more and kind of get deeper and deeper into the issue. But projecting it onto a toy is like magic for for younger kids. Usually around 12 or so, they kind of start to like get out of that age. And so you, they just need more time to kind of mull over and think of their own thoughts. But again, younger kids projecting on a toy is a wonderful technique. And then again, give them ample time You know, I mean, if you're working through your own feelings, I know like as an adult, sometimes I have a feeling and I'm thinking, I don't quite feel jealous. I don't quite feel angry. What is that feeling that I'm feeling? I'm not totally sure. Maybe I'll journal about it. Maybe I'll kind of sleep on it and then kind of it'll come to me, you know, but kids, they take a lot more time. Some kids are just really sharp with those, you know, those answers. And some kids are just like, I don't know the feeling because I don't know the language or the words or the vocabulary to pinpoint that feeling. So you can always start to kind of give them ideas like, okay, well, jealousy kind of looks like this and give them an example. Anger kind of looks like this and give them an example. You know, um, bitterness kind of, kind of feels like this. And, you know, what feeling do you kind of identify with? What feeling would you say makes the most sense for this situation? right now and then you know again let those kids just show you their insight it's amazing how their minds work you know especially young kids they definitely they have all of it there but a lot of times they don't have the vocabulary did that answer your question I hope (laughs) let's see any other questions oh okay let's see hi (laughs) 
Thank you again for coming live. I really appreciate it. And again, if anyone, if you think anyone would benefit from this conversation, definitely tag them down below. Um, and I will be putting this into my workshop bubble on top of Instagram. So if there aren't any other questions, I don't think there, I don't see any more. So I'm going to give you the journal questions. And again, I will put that in Instagram as well. So you can kind of see those. You have more time. So the first journal question, this is for destructive criticism. Number one, how is this affecting my life? And this is big because sometimes when we get destruct, we're receiving destructive criticism. We think, oh, it was an isolated event. It really ticked me off, but I'm over it. I'm totally over it. And unfortunately, you may not actually be completely over it. The back, you know, your subconscious, your unconscious mind might still be kind of mulling it over. And if it's mulling it over, it might be kind of wiring and firing that new, you know, mechanism in your brain where you're like, I'm going to be really antsy or apprehensive to go near that person or I'm going to be really like, you know, on defense now because of this situation. So how is this affecting my life? If you are doing it yourself and you didn't realize it, how is it affecting your life? Is it affecting your relationships? Which relationships are, is it affecting? You know, is it affecting your communication skills? Is it affecting your mood? You know, how is this affecting your life? Journal question number two. Why does their opinion matter to me? Why does it matter? It's just an opinion. You know, the person who said, you know, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Total bullshit. <laughs> words hurt. Words really hurt. I mean, they can cut like a knife and they go through and they go deep and they can linger, you know, they linger for such a long time. But the biggest question, why does their opinion matter to me? Do I want this person's respect? Do I respect this person? You know, is their opinion of me so meaningful that I'm gonna allow it to change how I behave or change how I see the world? Is it really that meaningful? And if the question, and if the answer is no, because most of the time when someone's, just, you know, being really destructive to us, their opinion really doesn't matter. If it's a loved one, if it's a parent, like an older parent, or if it's a kid where, you know, they're starting to show these habits and it really hurts you because you think, you know, I'm doing such a great job as a mom or a dad. And, you know, what you're saying is really, it hurts. Why? Why does it hurt? Because as a parent, you know, we have those bonds. If you are receiving it from someone else, and it's a, a relative, why does it matter to you? Do you really need their approval? If you're an adult now, is it gonna change your life if they say something nice? If it's gonna change your life and some impact your life in a certain way, if they all of a sudden stopped being critical? Yes or no? If it's a child and they're saying something, why are you being triggered? What is it internally that's actually triggering? Are they saying something that is similar to what you heard? And if so, are they hearing it from you? Are they hearing it from that same individual? Let's say a grandparent, you know, where is it coming from and why does it matter to you? Because the moment you realize why it matters, you can shift it, you can reframe it and you can basically either get rid of it or understand it and understanding where it comes from makes a huge impact in our unconscious subconscious mind. So our brains can kind of mull it over and be like, ah, oh, yeah, I get it now. And it doesn't, it doesn't have the same pull. It doesn't have the same trigger for me anymore. All right. Journal question number three. Is there proof or examples that their opinion is wrong? Remember, this is an opinion. Destructive criticism is just their opinion. And it doesn't mean that it's fact. And it doesn't mean it's based in fact at all. <laughs> so are there examples externally in the world? This does, it can be in your family, it can be in your neighborhood, it can be in your community, it can be in uh, associations that you're involved with, it can be as society at large. Are there examples out there that prove that their opinion is wrong? Because if it is, if there's some kind of example, you know, like, oh, this is not uh, how most people act, or this behavior is definitely deemed unacceptable in certain areas of the world, or, you know, most people would never accept this kind of behavior. Because if there are examples, it's just an opinion. And again, it tells your unconscious mind, hey, there's proof out there that this is not acceptable, which means I don't have to accept it. Because if it's not a fact, 
I don't have to accept it. And then the brain goes, poof, ah, well, if I don't have to accept it, then it no longer bothers me anymore. <laughs> All right, so question number four. What can I learn from this? It's such a simple question and it seems really kind of uh, almost silly because when someone's doing destructive criticism towards you or unfortunately if you've done it towards someone else, what can I learn from this? Seems like nothing. I can't learn anything from this. This was a terrible situation and it's done, you know, thankfully, or I don't, I don't want to be around that person anymore. But what can you truly learn? What kind of valuable wisdom can you take out of this? Is it, I'm not going to put myself in a position where people are going to behave that way? Is it, uh, you know, that person show me their true colors. I need to believe them. You know, that's definitely something that's a, a characteristic in them. So I'm not going to trust them or I'm not going to be a part of their situation or, or their environment anymore. Is it something where, you know, you can kind of extract some information and, and understand, you know, the underlying reason why it's happening. What can you learn from this situation? What can you put into kind of like, you know, your, your own bucket of, of, um, education or wisdom? There's always wisdom in every situation. You can always get some kind of tidbit and then you can either work with it or understand, I don't want to work with this. And that's a good, that's still good. Even if you don't want to work with it, now you know. I don't, I don't want to put myself in that situation anymore. Number five, is this a, and this is a biggie, is this a reflection of something I am doing in my life? Oh, this is kind of hard because if you're getting a lot of destructive criticism, are you giving it out? <laughs> are you teaching others how you want to be talked to? If you're being really destructively critical, does that open the door for other people to be really destructively critical to you, either on purpose or by accident, by default? Are you teaching, let's say kids, are you teaching them how to be destructively critical? And that's now how they're communicating with you because that's what they see. Are you being destructively critical? And then other people think, oh, that's acceptable behavior. You know, around this person, I can get all negative and whatever. It doesn't really, you know, that's just how it is with them. I've definitely had experiences like that where there were certain people I hung out with and, you know, I just felt kind of toxic at the end. You know, it always became one of those situations where we would kind of like nag and gripe and I was like, oh gosh, this does, this relationship does not feel good. I don't feel good and charged when I'm around this person and it brings me down. It makes me more negative. So I had to let that person go. And guess what? Once I did, there was kind of like some, you know, there was some rebounding and some, um, you know, uh, leg time where I had to learn that that behavior wasn't acceptable. But once I truly let it go, I realized, gosh, you know, my friendships now are so incredible. I feel charged around this person. We don't gripe when we're together. We have fun. We have engaging conversations. I would never say anything critically mean to this person and I would never receive it back. Why? Because I'm setting myself up for success. You know, I chose people now to be around me that are positive and that's amazing. But I had to learn, you know, is there something that I'm doing? Is this something I'm allowing? So is this a reflection of something that you are doing in your life? Because you'll pull people towards you that have a similar kind of mindset. So if you want a good positive mindset or you want a good positive mindset for your kids, you need to set the example. You know, kids see everything we do, whether we want them to or not. And even if they're in another room, you know, man, their ears can hear everything. And so I've had experiences where I thought something was a private, quiet conversation with my spouse and my daughter still heard it. <laughs> so, you know, so always remember, is this something that, you know, that I can work on, you know, and if so, put the effort out because happy people don't criticize. Happy people inquire. Happy people, you know, um, they display wisdom, but only when, uh, when people are receptive to it. If someone's not receptive, you can't just talk their ear off. You can't lecture their ear off. They're just not, they're not going to hear it. Or they're going to think, you know, you could have the most amazing, like life changing gem of wisdom. And if that person's not in a state of receiving that information, it's just going to go <laughs> in and out or never come in. And so, you know, if you have, this is especially since I work, I work with children. This is especially true with kids trying to find that happy elevated state where they're having a good time playing or they're having, you know, um, 
whether they're having a, a, and a, a relaxing time, you know, cuddling, those are wonderful times where you can bring information into their, you know, sort of realm of thought because they're already more receptive to that receiving love. If they're not, like they're kind of hangry or they just are getting off to school, they've just come home from school, they have sensory overload, that is not the best time to talk about things. I see a question. Um, Chris Ward, yes, I do have a plan for a team and a business. <laughs> yes, excellent question. So I am just starting. I actually, I've been self-employed for 12 years um, and I love my business, but I am uh, switching gears and doing more of the coaching route. So um, this last year, 2018 has been, 2017 and 2018 have been heavily, um, heavily uh, educating myself. So um, I am now NLP certified. Um, I'll be taking hypnosis uh, this next fall. And uh, I am certified in uh, EFT, TFT, and um, a bunch of other things. <laughs> so <laughs> lots and lots of education has been uh, kind of warped into this. And I love working with kids. I love working with kids because they're moldable and they haven't quite gotten that bitterness that some of us adults have gotten. And I speak from experience, you know. I was a very optimistic, positive kid, um, despite some circumstances that I had that were very, very toxic. And, uh, and I, I managed to keep that for a long time until he became an adult because I was, you know, in my environment, I was able to see a clear distinction between myself, here I am, and the people around me. And I repelled that. I wanted to be different. But when I became an adult, I could see, gosh, you know, all of a sudden, you know, all the monkey see, monkey do, that was that repetitive sort of programmed state that I was in and I started to allow the toxicity to come in. And for parents, making sure that they don't put their own ish that they've had to deal with, making sure they can heal onto their kids. Because <laughs> that's the worst. That's the worst when you want to do a good job and you really are, you know, trying so hard and then your own kind of BS comes out and then you see, you know, your little person starting to mimic that and it just, you know, it breaks it breaks the heart. And so I know that there are parents out there doing such an incredible job and they just are so hard on themselves and so critical on themselves because they really, they want their kids to kind of be better than they are, except that's not really the platform you need to go off of. The platform needs to be, I'm gonna work on myself first so that I feel whole so I don't project like we were talking about with the destructive criticism. There's something that I don't quite feel good about within myself. I'm now projecting that onto the other person. So we don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? Let's see. Yeah. I can't see all of it. I think it'll tell me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Perfect. Oh my gosh. Well, it's 12.49, you guys. I promised you 30 minutes. So if there's no more questions, we're going to wrap up. But thank you so much for being here. I'm going to be doing these live Saturdays for a while. I think noon is kind of the most optimal time. We'll kind of play with that maybe a little bit. Um, and then we've covered everything we're talking about today. Definitely check back. It will be uh, on the workshop bubble on the top of my Instagram feed. So... Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. Thank you for being a part of this. And uh, thank you for being so awesome and asking questions. I really appreciate it. <laughs>